Chito Cane Sheuda Santa Ridano Dashi Berto Berto Rocket Mosa Hard Game Rocket Dam Kita The Pokémon TCG was first released in Japan in October 1996, more than two years before Base Set found its way into Americans' hands. Unlike its American counterpart, little is known about the game's early years in Japan. Without resources like Pojo, we don't have much in the way of how the metagame developed. But thanks to the Pokémon Card Fan Club magazine, we have information about the first official Pokémon card game tournament. I'm the Ruby Retro Historian, and this is the dawn of Pokémon competitive play in Japan. Held on June 14th and 15th in Chiba, Japan, the first Pokémon tournament was certainly a unique event. Instead of qualifiers to earn an invitation to play, 1,000 kids age 15 and under were selected via lottery to participate. 160 participants could register ahead of time via postcard from an issue of Koro Koro magazine, but if too many youngsters applied, another lottery would be held. Instead of age divisions like we're used to, tournaments were restricted based on grade level, with three of four tournaments being held for elementary age children and one being held for junior high age children. Tournament rounds were single elimination, with players competing in a maximum of five rounds. Each round lasted only 15 minutes, with the semifinals and finals lasting a whopping 20 minutes. Players who were fortunate enough to place in the top three earned the first printing of number one, two, or three trainer cards, featuring a Pikachu holding the corresponding trophy. Though not playable in any official tournament, they were some of the rarest cards in the game up to this point, so that has to count for something. The sets legal for the tournament were Japan's base set, or expansion pack, and jungle. Unlike the base jungle format in America, Japanese players had access to additional promo cards that would not be released until later in the West, if they were released at all. The Pocket Monsters fan book was released in May 1997 with the promo card Super Energy Retrieval, which we would not get until Neo Genesis, an entire generation of Pokémon later. This card functioned as though you played two Energy Retrieval at the same time. Discard two to restore four. The book also contained Energy Absorption Mewtwo, which we would not get until after the release of Fossil. With all that in mind, Let's take a look at the winning deck lists from each tournament, which are the only deck lists to survive from the event. I want to preface this by saying that the whole lottery system really shows when it comes to these deck lists. Players clearly had no idea what was good or how to build strong decks. They just played what they had without planning for any actual metagame. But that's what's so fun and unique about this tournament, the amount of cards that otherwise would not see play making a splash in the winning lists. Also, the lack of draw cards is just plain astounding. This must have made for some crazy top deck gameplay. But enough of me talking, let's take a look at these winning lists. The first tournament took place on the morning of June 14th and was comprised of only elementary age players. Wataru Oishi won with his Firo Scyther deck that featured 12 different one counts of Pokemon. Now, we know that Jungle Firo is pretty bad, but as a Spiro and Firo lover, it makes me so happy to see it get some play. If I were a betting man, I would guess that this was one of the few thick evolution lines Oishi-san had, so he rolled with it, and added in a bunch of one-of Pokémon for type coverage. At least he had two Lickitung to stall out his opponents. But look at the trainers! One of almost every card, and no draw! What an absolute legend! But the fun doesn't stop here. The second tournament on the 14th was also an elementary age tournament, and was won by Nobuhiro Miyahara with his Nidoking and Friends deck. This list owns! He had all the powerful colorless Pokémon available at the time in Clefable, Wigglytuff, Chansey, and Lickitung, and even crammed in a Raichu for good measure. Additionally, the Nidoking line is 2-1-1. I'm not sure that even qualifies the deck as a Nidoking variant, 
But again, I really do just love seeing players use these iconic cards that otherwise weren't playable. Like the previous list, we have no trainers to really speak of, but at least he did have Item Finder to recover all those one-of cards. The morning of June 15th saw the only Junior High Age tournament, which was won by Tatsuro Ichikai and his Alakazam Damage Swap deck. Just from a glance, you can tell that the older players were starting to get the hang of deck building. While this list ran no search or draw trainers, it did run a max 4 Kangaskhan for its use as a starter to go through the deck and find the needed pieces to set up an Alakazam. This deck also ran higher counts of all main Pokémon, as well as key trainers and double colorless energy. While I'm not sure what the motivation behind running Devolution Spray was, it's clear ichikai son understood the synergy between Alakazam and Pokémon Center. He also appears to have a sense of the metagame, running Jigglypuff and a Dragon Airline to deal with opposing Mr. Mimes, where his Pokémon otherwise dealt too much damage to take knockouts. While you could attack with Abra, using a 30 HP Pokémon that you really just wanted to become an Alakazam feels bad. I wish we had more lists from the Junior High Tournament to see if his meta call was correct, and to see what other properly constructed decks players brought to the table. The last tournament was held in the afternoon of June 15th, and was a third elementary age tournament. This final tournament was won by Yuya Tamai, with a deck featuring Charmeleon backed by a variety of Pokémon. It seems Tamai-san realized the strength of attacking for 20 damage for one energy, running high counts of Rattata and Staryu. And he even ran Bill! Finally, someone realized drawing cards during your turn was a good thing. Unfortunately, I can't say much for the rest of his trainer choices. This deck is just not at the same level as the Alakazam list we looked at earlier. One other thing viewers might notice is that the deck is missing a lot of evolved Pokémon, like Blastoise and Charizard. I have to think this is a symptom of card availability, and that Tamai-san simply did not have the evolutions necessary to include. Or we can give him the benefit of the doubt, and say he realized that attacking with basics was more important than cluttering his deck with Stage 2s. In revisiting the base to jungle format, Jason Klazinski created a list that played a 3-1 Charmeleon line just to deal with Scyther. So, it's not necessarily unheard of, but maybe I'm giving tamai son too much credit here. Whatever the case, this is certainly a bit more coherent of a deck than the Firo and Nidoking decks that won the previous day's tournaments. I think it's pretty clear that these deck lists are bad, so why should we take the time to think about them at all? Well, this is the first ever Pokémon tournament, it's important to see where we started and how far we've come in our play. Many of us probably had decks like these as kids until we discovered forums and learned just how good Haymaker and Wigglytuff were. If we ignore past results because the players or deck lists weren't elite, then how can we ever expect to learn and improve our own gameplay? Clearly, American players were better at building decks in the early months of the game, but we also had another card game to base deck building on. Magic the Gathering, which had been in the US since 1993, and had a mana system similar to Pokémon's energy cards. The game had only just made its way to Japan around the time the Pokémon TCG was becoming popular, and it certainly wasn't marketed to kids just yet. The Yu-Gi-Oh! OCG was still a few years away from its 1999 release, so there was no other card game Japanese players could pull from for this tournament. Additionally, in the mid-90s, the internet was still in its early stages, whereas by Pokémon's American release in 1999, players had greater web access to established forums and written articles about the game. With so much working against Japanese players, it's impressive that those like ichikai san figured out a damage swap build for this tournament. Well, perhaps not the most competitive, this event helped spur a tournament circuit across Japan, leading to the Charizard and Blastoise Mega Battle tournaments later in 1997 and 1998. The Pokémon TCG was establishing itself as a force in Japan, and as we know, it would soon take the rest of the world by storm. But that's another story. We hope you enjoyed this detour from the history of the American competitive scene. If you like this video and want to see us continue breaking down early Japanese tournament results, 
like and subscribe so we know you're interested in videos like this. Be sure to leave a comment below telling us how these decks compared to your first decks. If you're anything like me, I ran about 30 energy cards in my deck because my friend and I were convinced that you always had to discard energy after using an attack, whether the card told you to or not. We've come a long way from those early days of playground rules, from playing sleeveless on picnic tables to now making videos discussing the history of the game and playing sleeved historical decks. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, this is the Ruby Retro Historian signing off.